are still interested, what's it like to be out there um, in the galleries. Um, sometimes it's just being helpful. Do you have an old light there? Um, Uh, in a lot of cases, what you're doing is you're working with groups of school-age children, um, and you almost can't see the student volunteers. She's right here, um, but she's like swamped by all these children who are. They, I think they were playing a, a Coast Salish uh, stick game, mm -hmm. and they got to make their own sticks uh, out of popsicle sticks, but these sticks uh, have designs on them. And so she was helping them make those and explain to them the significance of that, and they were just popping right. um, So, but in a nice way. Um, so that is a really common scene. You're working with a group of people, and you're working with a group of people where you're not necessarily lecturing them, but they're doing something or touching something. They're engaged with things, and that very it much is a part of our teaching philosophy. Mm -hmm. We're like experience it, do it, touch it, especially since so much in the museum um, is behind glass and is untouchable. We're really big on getting things that people can touch um, and ask questions about out there and getting them to actively think about, you know, why is this made this way or what is this made out of or, you know, why don't they do it this way or, you know, we, we're very into that and then very activity oriented as well. You know, we're not going to just talk to you about weaving. We want you to try it so that you can appreciate that it isn't just slapping some thread together. <laughs> it's simple. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out it's actually a little more involved than that. And so they can appreciate that. I think you get it more when someone lets you experience it rather than tells you, oh, guess what? It's really hard. You have to have a lot of skill. So, oh, yeah, that's right. You have to know here. Okay. Um, some of it, that's an archaeology shot. I had to put that in there as an archaeologist. And again, it's, it's this hands-on exploration. Um, so even the tours, you know, sometimes there'll be a little bit of talking, but then they'll be like, okay, and now we're going to do this activity that's going to help you think about what these artifacts are used for, or how they're made, or what they're made out of, or where these fossils come from, or what time period they're from. So it's that active. And then um, sometimes, um, this is especially true of our cultural tours, there are activities where you can try um, making something or doing something that's so that you better understand the principle of how something is made. Um, and maybe understand a little bit more about the significance of it uh, within the culture um, that it comes from. Um, I would say most of our tours are First Nations tours. Um, focusing on uh, native cultures, indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Um, and we have such a great um, and extensive collection of, of the museum itself, has such a great um, collection of materials um, that it kind of makes sense. It also turns out that statewide, and you may remember mm -hmm. this if you're from the state, every third or fourth grader, mm -hmm. just depends on the district, has a requirement that you need to learn something about Native American cultures in Washington State. So they come to us for that. These two students are actually demonstrating, we don't have one here today, but how you make a bentwood box. They're explaining it with a cardboard model so people can understand how that's made from one piece of wood. And it's actually cut a certain way and then steamed and bent so that it will form a single, use a single piece of wood to make a box. Um, and these, these students here, I don't know, I think they were like high school age or something, and normally I think they were too cool to do that, but they were like, show us. So, here's another example. Um, another archaeology shot. Sometimes it's just using existing teaching specimens that we have. That's like the hind end of a uh, sea lion. <laughs> and the, the guy that's helping that kid out, Brian, I remember, he actually went on and did some faunal analysis in archaeology, and went on and got a master's degree in I'm going to the last one. So, but <laughs> I agree. It's a perfect right. time for them. Yeah. And let me see. Is there any more? Oh, yeah. And then a lot of what um, the work is, is um, you'll spend a lot of time interacting with people and setting stuff up and taking stuff down, which is what these students are doing. They're setting stuff up. And I noticed there's pizza down here, and that's not normal. Um, <laughs> it's like some special thing. But the big jar of Elmer's Blue is normal. And um, so there's lots of. Um, since especially the cultural tours have a lot of activities-based um, craft-type 
activities. There's a lot of prep work involved, so you need to like make sure you have all the felt squares ready and all the glue glue or dryers are filled. And so some of it's just like the basic organizational, which some students tell me they don't mind. They find kind of therapeutic after a hard day, <laughs> you know, trying to think about things. They're like, eh, it's just me and the glue, it's just me and the bamboo skewers and the fishing rod activities. It's just me. So okay, I think that's it for those. Okay. So you might be thinking, well, who are these people and what would I fit into that mix? It's been my experience generally um, that most of the students who get involved are juniors and seniors. And I don't know if that's because they feel like they're more focused in a particular discipline and they kind of know what they want to be involved with. Or maybe they just have more flexibility in their schedules. That could be as well. Um, because like I said, most of our tours take place during the weekdays. and they mostly take place between the hours of 10 and 2. So that's, I think, especially when you're a first year or sophomore, and you've got those big lecture classes that often meet in the morning and end sometime about like 12, 30 or so. It doesn't work out so great with your schedules. And that's the only thing I can think of that might be driving that. But I did notice that in between like the first year and the next couple of years, we got an increase in freshmen and sophomores. So it doesn't matter where you are in the whole scheme of things. Um, there's all different levels of folks participating. Um, and who knows, maybe that fraction will change over time. Thank you. OK, so we don't want to keep out of it, you may ask. Um, I think if you can hit it again, there'll be a picture that pops up. Um, so students have told me all kinds of things. I say, so what, what was in it for you? I know what was in it for me, but what's in it for you? And they said, well, you know, part of it is just you have a place you can go to where you can be around other people who care about what you care about. So if you care about museums, or you care about culture, or you like interacting with other people, or you're interested in teaching, or you just generally, I don't know, some of these folks weren't really even majoring in anthropology, but um, they were just, they were a great class. They just had a good vibe, and they were just together. And they, they had that community thing that happens sometimes. And so this is definitely one of the perks of this, is that you get that feeling which are part of the team. So I think there's another one there. Uh, there's other things people get out of it. You know, people say, um, this is Gloria, yeah. um, people say, um, you know, I got more public speaking skills, so I just, they're more generally applicable skills that I can transfer no matter, to other professions, no matter what I wind up doing. Um, it made me think seriously. I did have a few people tell me, uh, it made me think seriously about becoming a teacher. And I didn't think of myself as a teacher before, but I tried it, and I realized I could teach, so <laughs> why not think about it some more that way? Um, but I really think, instead of me mattering on about it, um, it would be best to have Lorraine talk a little bit about it, because she actually is a great example of somebody who is in your shoes and um, had a Burke volunteer outreach experience and um, <laughs> wound up working for us. So she's going to tell you a little bit about yeah. What that, what, you know, what happened that made it happen that way, what was useful about it. So. Yeah, and then if you guys have any questions yeah. too while I'm talking, yeah. feel free to yeah. jump in. Yeah. Um, so my basic experience was I was an uh, anthropology undergrad, and I had uh, the University of Washington was sending me emails on a regular basis saying that I had to declare a major <laughs> because I was incredibly undecided. I was doing like sociology, anthropology, psychology, like any ology <laughs> that I ever thought about. I was taking lots of geology classes. And I was totally undecided. And I eventually I scrolled through and it was like sociology or anthropology. And just that quarter it happened to me that anthropology classes were just more appealing to me. And I just declared and went with it. But I totally fell in love with anthropology. And I started getting worried towards the end that well, this is it. Like, what do you do with an anthropology degree? <laughs> like, you look at great. And, like, where can I take this? And what can I actually do with it and um, continue all of the passion that I have for anthropology in the real world? And um, I was looking online and I found the Berkman 1 class. And I, I'd never been to the Berkman Museum up until that point, but I've been to other museums and I, I love museums and I know it's kind of one of my hobbies, but um, I eventually went there and checked it out, and then I took the Berk 101 class, and through the class, uh, it kind of